Hi there, my name is Stefan Frisch. I'm a professor in communication sciences and disorders at Appalachian State University in the United States. I visited the University of Canterbury as an Erskine Fellow in the Department of Linguistics. My PhD is in linguistics, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, some phonetic tools that you may have studied in this class and how they are applied uh, to looking at communication disorders. What you call phonetics is referred to as speech science in communication sciences and disorders. That covers both uh, acoustic and articulatory phonetics. So when I teach a speech science course, which I think is fairly like this one, um, we talk about the source filter theory of speech production uh, with vocal fold vibration as the sound source and uh, the shape of the vo vocal tract as the sound filter or resonator creating the different speech sounds. Uh, we go over some acoustic measures of speech and also different tools that are used to allow us to look at articulation directly. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about how we apply these things to disorders involving the voice uh, or articulation or resonance. I've got four examples to show you. One is tools involving acoustic analysis of the voice, primarily fundamental frequency. The second uh, shows you how we image the vocal fold using a laryngoscope. The third looks at articulation errors and looking at them using uh, an ultrasound scanner to directly uh, image the tongue. And then last I'll finish by talking a little bit about how we can study variability in articulation, which includes um, both things like typical errors as well as variation in what is otherwise seemingly normal speech that might provide insight in communication disorders. Acoustic analysis of the voice is based on the fact that the process of phonation results in periodicity in the acoustic signal. That periodicity is actually a harmonic series that has a fundamental frequency and multiples of that fundamental frequency as harmonics. The fundamental frequency matches the rate of the vibration of the vocal folds in creating phonation. We use voice pitch in communication for intonation. We also use voice pitch and amplitude for stress and focus in speech. There are a variety of disorders that affect the voice. For example, Parkinson's disease affects the neurological signals to the muscles, including the speech muscles. Reduced signals to these muscles result in uh, changes in how the respiratory and phonatory muscles work, and the usual result there is a loss of variation in speech, or uh, what's called a monotone speech sound. Part of the study of communication disorders is knowing what normal looks like, so we have normative data um, for what phonation should look like on the basis of age and also gender from things like uh, reading a relatively standard um, passage. For example, an adult male fundamental frequency is usually around 125 hertz, uh, plus or minus 25 hertz, and the variation used while reading a standard passage is about one octave, which is a musical term for a doubling of frequency. Um, so it's a, a from a low value to double that low value is a typical range. Another disorder that affects voice is called dysphonia. There are a variety of dysphonias. Uh, this is a general term for a condition that affects your ability to maintain or to control phonation. Um, for example, there can be muscle weaknesses that lead to asymmetry in the positioning of the vocal folds or how the vocal folds are tensed. There can also be uh, physical problems with the vocal folds, such as nodules, polyps, or other irregularities that affect the periodicity of the vocal fold and also how much noise comes from the phonation signal. We can measure uh, impacts of these kinds of things in voice acoustics by looking at variation from cycle to cycle. Um, and also by looking at the presence of periodicity in what should be a um, voiced part of speech. Examining variation in pitch from cycle to cycle is referred to as jitter. Examining amplitude variation is referred to as shimmer. 
In typical speech, jitter is usually less than 1%, so less than 1% variation in the fundamental frequency from cycle to cycle. For a fundamental frequency of 100 Hz, that would be about 1 Hz. Amplitude variation is usually less than 4%. Uh, a measure of how much noise is in the voice is called harmonic to noise ratio. That is typically above 7 dB, and in fact in most normal speakers it's more like 20 dB. Here I have an example of a fundamental frequency contour showing a, a, basically a graph over time of the value of the fundamental frequency of speech, which reflects periodicity in the vocal fold. Any place where there is a break in the thin squiggly black line is a period where there is no detectable vocal fold vibration going on, no detectable periodicity. I've marked what appears to be visually the maximum value across this signal and the minimum value across this signal, which gives us some idea of what the range is in the bracket on the left. I've also put in a dotted line for the mean or average fundamental frequency in this example. We can look at these things in a recording of speech using the PROT program. Uh, in the pitch menu for any sound object, any sound recording, uh, there is the ability to get pitch that produces the, uh, or computes the mean pitch value for whatever you happen to have selected, or for your whole window if you don't have anything selected. can also tell you the maximum or the minimum pitch, and it was in this menu that I created the contour that you saw uh, in the previous slide, um, a black and white graph showing the fundamental frequency changing over time. There is also a pulses menu where the PROT program attempts to identify exactly where the uh, individual periods of the vibration of the vocal folds are. And from that it can figure out whether it thinks something is voiced or not. And in that menu you can produce a voice report which shows you a whole bunch of different measures of the voice, uh, including jitter and shimmer and harmonic to noise ratio, some of our fancier measures of the speech signal. When using these measures in PROT for speech, what kind of sample you're looking at matters quite a bit. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, me talking in this lecture, somebody having a conversation, or somebody reading a speech passage, you would expect a certain amount of variation, and a certain amount of variation is normal. Uh, if you have somebody just giving you a sustained vowel, like ah, uh, you're not expecting, for example, a big change in the pitch, so a big difference between pitch maximum and minimum. On the other hand, some of those finer measures, like the period-to-period -period variability in jitter or shimmer, uh, are best looked at with a sustained vowel, because there the speaker is actually trying to basically produce the same thing over time, uh, and so there inability to maintain a steady voice doesn't get confused with the natural variation in a speech package. Uh, so I was going to show you a couple of examples of this by flipping over to Prot. Um, here I have an example of a recording um, from a person with a speech disorder. Man's first boat. Long ago, men found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. So there you can probably hear, if you have reasonably good speakers, uh, that the voice does not sound particularly steady, and that perhaps it has a little bit of um, uh, variability or perhaps noisiness to it. Um, we can uh, back up that perceptual judgment that we might have, uh, more specifically though, with these various measures. So for example, in the pitch menu, I need to, for all of these measures, first sort of turn them on in the menu. So I have to show the pitch before it can do other sorts of analyses. Um, but then from there, I can do something like get pitch, which will give me, um, oops, do something like get pitch, which will give me the value for uh, pitch over a particular selection. So here the fundamental frequency is 102.5. It can also tell me what the minimum pitch, in this case 86.6, and the maximum pitch, which is 132.1, .1, 
I mentioned a typical level of voice variation is one octave or a doubling. So if the minimum is 86, we would expect a typical speaker to produce a range up to about double that, which would be 172. So the speaker appears to have a reduced level of pitch variation in their speech. That may be due to some sort of neurological problem with control of the speech muscles. Um, I have a second recording. These are steady state vowels produced by uh, an American graduate assistant for one of my classes. So those are the three corner vowels and the uh, central vowel uh that we use quite a bit in American English. Um, the steady state ah uh, vowel is a really good example to um, look at something uh, like those cycle to cycle measures. So I first in the pulses menu have to show the pulses. I get blue lines for where Prot thinks each individual um, uh, start of a glottal cycle is. If I actually zoom in on my selection here, oops, selection, uh, you get a better idea of how that pulses work. So each blue line here is the start of a cycle uh, in the vibration of the vocal fold. If I zoom in even further, um, you maybe even get a clearer version of that. All right, so if I go back to selecting most of this vowel and in my pulses get a voice report, I can see this person's mean pitch was 121.7. It's on the low end for a female, but that's all right. Uh, minimum is 116, maximum is 123. That's not very much variation, but this person isn't uh, producing communicative speech. There's no point in having variation. They're just producing a steady vowel, so we don't expect much variation. Um, Prot looks at whether it finds any instances where it doesn't appear there's periodicity, but in this case there's zero, which you'd expect with a typical voice. Uh, her jitter value, there's a variety of measures here. Um, we can just look at the first one, is 0.12%. That's well below that 1% variation. The shimmer value is 2.6%. That's well below that 4% value that we might uh, uh, think might indicate an issue and the harmonic to noise ratio in terms of dB is 24.6, so a very uh, clear voice uh, with mostly periodic noise and very low amplitude uh, aperiodic noise in it. The disordered speech sample that we had isn't the best for looking at things like jitter and shimmer, but we can pick a vowel and um, and run the measure anyway. The computer doesn't care whether we're measuring something appropriate or not. If I turn my pulses on, we get the start of each glottal cycle as far as Prot is concerned. And notice at the very beginning, uh, it can't find any periodicity. If I run my voice report, I get a mean pitch of 103. Um, uh, a little bit more variation, in part because this person wasn't producing just a steady state vowel. Um, it finds a couple of um, places where it thinks there is no voicing going on, so there's a certain lack of voicing here. That's at the very beginning, uh, though, so it's possible that that's part of the previous consonant, for example. Uh, we have a jitter measure of 1.1. Uh, percent, so that's a little bit over that 1% threshold we might be worried about. A shimmer measure of 7.4, that's over that 4% threshold that we might be worried about. And mean harmonic to noise ratio uh, is at 8.3 dB. That is over the 7 I gave you, but like I said, oftentimes that's 20 or higher. So, you know, getting close to 7, if we're suspicious something is going on, um, we would want to take a closer look at that. Okay, uh, so that was the first topic, acoustic analysis of voice and some of the things you can do in a, a speech program really anybody can use, uh, prot, to uh, look at, at variation in the voice. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is direct visualization of articulation. First, starting with the larynx. Um, uh, one term for this is laryngoscopy. Um, this is also referred to as a as a endoscopy of the larynx. 
um, using an endoscope, but we use endoscopes for lots of other things. So if you just Google endoscope videos, who knows what they'll be sticking a camera into. Um, if we use this to look at the larynx, we get a direct visualization of the vocal folds. Uh, these things basically use a small camera. Um, in a rigid endoscopy, there's a lens basically at the end of a stick. You rest that stick on the top of the tongue and kind of slide that lens back uh, toward the back of the throat. Try not to run into the back of the throat and uh, take a good quality picture of what the larynx looks like while a person is doing something like producing a sustained vowel like ah. We also have the ability to do flexible endoscopy. This uses a fiber optic camera that gets threaded through the nasal cavity, so it hangs down in the back of the pharynx, uh, goes through the velopharyngeal port over the velum, uh, and that gives us a view of the um, larynx as well. The nice thing about that camera is since it runs through the nasal cavity, it doesn't interfere with the movement of the tongue. Um, Though sometimes when you retract the tongue back into the pharynx for something like an oo or an o, uh, you might run into it um, and push its view out of the way a little bit. Um, but you can use a fiber optic camera with normal speech. So uh, for examples of laryngoscopy, you'd actually be surprised how many things you can find on YouTube. Uh, so here, for example, is a screen capture from a YouTube video um, showing an abnormality in the vocal folds. That V shape in the center of the screen uh, is a, an actual visible um, image of the vocal folds using a rigid endoscope, so it's a pretty nice quality picture. Um, above the V shape on the vocal folds, we would have their connection point on the arytenoid cartilages. Um, at the bottom end, the vocal folds come together at what's called the anterior commissure on the thyroid cartilage. So it's movement of the arytenoid cartilages um, that bring the vocal folds together and help phonation happen, or separating the uh, arytenoid cartilages from each other would open up the vocal folds like they are here and allow breathing to happen or would take place during a voiceless sound. Um, so if I hop over to YouTube, you can look at a lot of videos yourself just by googling for laryngoscopy. You could look for uh, nodules or a polyps um, uh, or anything else you might happen to run into uh, poking around on the internet. Um, I skipped through the commercial and forward this up to a, a point where you can actually see some speech movement happen. This particular video doesn't have any sound in it to listen to, but you get a good idea of the movement of the vocal folds. Separating, coming back together for phonation, separating, coming back together for phonation. And you can see when they do come together, oops, just missed it. They do come together. Eh, doing things on YouTube is such fun. Uh, there is uh, a gap here. Uh, since the vibration of the vocal folds is so fast, it's a little hard to look uh, at a raw video and be sure what's really going on. But because of this um, polyp on the one vocal fold, when that runs into the other vocal fold, that's potentially going to leave a gap both above and below where that polyp is. That's going to make the vibration associated with the voice um, less regular than it is in a healthy voice. Uh, and that's also going to allow air to come through those gaps, which is going to create noise uh, in the voice. Okay, here we have a little bit more of a close-up view. You can sort of see vibration of the vocal folds here, and that actually leads me into my next topic, which is um, voice stroboscopy. So in voice stroboscopy, we take the same kind of picture of the vocal folds that we just had. This happens to be the, a picture of a, the vocal folds in a woman, we have, again, the uh, vocal folds here, arytenoid cartilages where those guys attach at the top. They're always attached down at the bottom. Um, fortunately, this uh, video has sound in it so we can hear what's going on. So 
So the uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor, or at least that's what we'd call them uh, in the U.S. and ENT, um, is having this woman go through uh, raising her voice pitch, lowering her voice pitch, uh, to see if she appears to have good control of the voice and normal voice function. The stroboscopy light will now be turned on. Okay, so uh, you heard him say the stroboscopy light will be turned on. So the way stroboscopy works is to uh, flash a light um, at a frequency that's just a little bit higher than the frequency of vibration of the vocal folds. So a computer listens to the voice, uh, does a pitch analysis like we saw in Prot, and then flashes a um, strobe light uh, at a speed that's just a little bit faster than the speed of vibration of the vocal folds. The effect that that has then uh, is a little bit like when you see a, a helicopter blade look like it's rotating slowly backwards. You end up seeing different um, cycles of the vibration of the voice across a whole bunch of, or sorry, I should say different parts of the cycle of vibration of the voice across a whole bunch of different cycles of vibration, and you get an apparent slow motion view of the voice in real time. So a clinician can look at this and make evaluations of function. So it looks like the voice is vibrating in slow motion um, because of the action of this strobe light, but you can hear it. It sounds normal. This is um, uh, a thing that a clinician can do in their office to get an idea of voice function without needing a super high-speed camera to make a recording and then slow it down to look at it. Um, instead, it puts together a whole bunch of vocal cycles uh, to give this effect. Okay, so uh, as I said, stroboscopy allows you to clinically uh, evaluate the glottal cycle. The idea is a strobe light flashes at a rate um, a little bit below the rate of phonation, and so the phonation happens slightly faster. So for example, we find uh, one picture at a peak, another picture a little bit after the peak, another picture a little bit farther along from there, another picture a little bit farther along from there, and so on, so that across these six pictures we get one part of the cycle of the vocal folds um, closing, let's say, uh, slowed down by a factor of six across these six different pictures. Actual stroboscopy um, slows it down quite a bit more than that, uh, effectively for our vision, but, but that's kind of the idea. By getting different bits of multiple cycles, we can watch a whole cycle go by uh, in an apparent slow motion. That allows us to look at uh, not just the anatomy, but also uh, more detailed function um, of the voice, how the vocal folds themselves are vibrating. Sometimes there can be very small nodules on the vocal folds that don't look like a bump, but because they're uh, a different tissue, they're stiffer, they can affect how the vocal folds vibrate, and you can see them in stroboscopy, but not other types of um, laryngoscopy. All right, the third topic is uh, visualizing articulation. Uh, articulation is pretty hard to visualize because all of it happens inside the head. That includes the phonation part of what you do as well, but if we you know, separate out the uh, source filter theory part of speech, call phonation the source, then we get the filter part from the action of other articulators like the lips, uh, the tongue, and the velum um, uh, that we look at as part of articulation in communication disorders, and the effect of articulation is to create resonance to create different speech sounds. Uh, we can take a video of the lips, for example, and directly look at them fairly easily. Uh, there is a method that uses electromagnetism to track pellets that you uh, glue onto the articulators uh, using dental adhesive. This is called electromagnetic um, articulometry, um, or EMMA. 
Uh, we can use an MRI machine, uh, like you have medically, to look at a mid-sagittal section of the head, for example, and get something very much like um, some of the drawings you might have uh, in a phonetics textbook. But at the moment, anyway, MRI technology is generally too slow to be able to capture uh, articulations as they happen. Um, Relatively recently, more and more people are using ultrasound to look at what the tongue is doing in speech, since the tongue is responsible for so many speech articulations. Um, ultrasound has its limitations too, though, uh, in that some of the tongue tip generally isn't visible because of air under the tongue, and we also don't get to see the palate above the tongue because of air over the tongue. Ultrasound is basically a super high frequency sound wave that goes through um, different density substances at different speeds. So it travels through the fleshy parts um, of the body at different speeds depending on what they're composed of and so we can get an image of internal structures. Um, but ultrasound does not travel across air. So anytime it hits air we basically lose signal. Uh, so here's an example from uh, an experiment of mine uh, looking at articulation uh, in kids. So we have a, uh, a kid here who was a participant in the study. He has this sort of awful metal um, holder thing on his head that holds the ultrasound probe, which is right down here under his chin. Um, that uh, gives us an image of the tongue that looks sort of like this. Probably doesn't look like a tongue to you, um, but once you look at enough of them, you start to get a feel for it. The back of the throat is um, back here, the tongue dorsum body is up here, and then we get into the tongue blade here and probably lose the tongue tip because of that bit of air that's under the tip of the tongue uh, at the front of the mouth. Um, behind the jaw, right by the lingual frenulum, if you talked about that when you talked about articulatory anatomy. Uh, we can take that upper surface of the tongue, which as it changes position, changes the shape of the oral and pharyngeal cavities as resonators, uh, and we can, um, with the assistance of a computer, usually, um, trace that out and look at changes in that shape in terms of uh, how they affect speech or how they reflect somebody's speech articulation. Uh, here is an example of an uh, ultrasound video um, showing a recording by a uh, person who is a stutterer. So there's a disfluency uh, at the beginning of this recording. And one thing you'll notice once I play it is once it starts moving, it actually starts to look quite a bit more like a tongue. So again, we have the ultrasound probe under the chin, like here. This is the back of the tongue, the tongue root back here. So if a person were to swallow, that food would go um, across the top of the tongue and down the back, down into the stomach. The uh, tongue body is in the middle, the tongue blade is toward the front, and again we get this kind of shadow here where the tongue tip would be, probably right in here, a little bit of the underside of the tongue tip there maybe, um, again because of that air pocket below the tongue. The palate normally would be up around here someplace I think, um, but uh, we don't see that in the image, again, because uh, this white here uh, is a reflection of the ultrasound beam by air in the oral cavity, uh, so the beam doesn't continue past there and we lose our image. Cab, tom, tap, com. Cab, tom, tap, com. Cab, tom, tap, com. Okay, and I can play that one more time. Cab, Tom, Tap, Com. Cab, Tom, Tap, Com. Cab, Tom, Tap, Com. Oops. Okay, so uh, this uh, stutterer gets hung up on that first K at the beginning of what uh, he's saying here, which is a um, kind of a bad tongue twister, a manufactured tongue twister for speech purposes. Uh, cab, Tom, Tap, Com. Um, so it's got alternating cuz and tuz in it. The k causes him to raise his tongue uh, dorsum up toward the uh, back of the hard palate and the soft palate. The t would cause the tongue blade and tip to be raised toward the alveolar ridge, which would be out here somewhere.
Uh, so again, we can take that tongue image, say for a ka, I just did a bad sort of hand trace within um, a PowerPoint for this to give you an idea of what that looks like. This gives us uh, you know, some idea of what the tongue posture is for producing something like a ka. And we can compare that to pr the production of other speech sounds um, uh, to see what's going on. In this example, I have three repetitions um, of a g sound uh, in blue here. So you see some variation across the three repetitions in terms of exactly uh, where the tongue position is. In red, I have something that, according to the tongue twister, was supposed to be a duh sound, an alveolar sound, um, but it appears to be basically exactly where these blue uh, traces representing velars are. So it would appear not just from listening to the person say the tongue twister, but from actually seeing what the tongue is doing, that in producing what was supposed to be a duh sound, uh, this uh, participant has created something that looks exactly like the articulation of a gu. One of the nice things about looking at articulation is we can see some things you can't hear. So in this example, we have in blue two repetitions of a duh sound showing a sort of typical posture. So the tongue dorsum is not real high. The front part of the tongue is pointing uh, a little more upward or at least a little less downward. Um, over that, I have an example of uh, what a velar sound, a g sound, would look like in this same vowel context by this speaker. And in red, we have the production of uh, one of the does in this tongue twister, where the tongue blade up in the front does indeed uh, end up where it's supposed to, but the tongue body in the middle seems to be abnormally raised. It's not raised so far as to be a guh and make a closure at the tongue dorsum and be a, a speech error that we could hear, but it does appear to be an unintended additional bit of um, guh production that has intruded on how this producing is this sorry this person is producing their duh. Uh, and so finding things like this is to some extent the point of doing phonetics that we can uh, see or measure things uh, that we can't just hear with the ear. Uh, so last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about um, not just those kind of errors, but looking at what appears to be normal speech uh, without errors in it, um, but looking at um, how stable someone is in producing that speech. So uh, taking a look at visually or measuring articulation, uh, or for that matter measuring acoustics um, across repeated instances. Um, of an utterance. So have this, the person say the same thing multiple times across the course of an experiment and look at how consistently that thing gets, uh, in this example, uh, articulated. So uh, again, I have examples using ultrasound. Um, so we can uh, visualize this variability either by just looking at a whole bunch of tongue traces or uh, by doing some um, uh, measurements using a computer. Uh, it is possible to um, uh, take these ultrasound traces and quantify in some way sort of how different one curve is from another um, to get us some uh, quantitative data to look at. Um, but for starters, I have an example um, again from a tongue twister experiment where we've taken all of the articulations of alveolar stops, either t or d, in a particular vowel context because um, context is going to affect what the shape of the tongue looks like due to co-articulation. On the left we have all the productions for uh, one participant and on the right we have all the productions for a different participant. And it was actually looking at um, these exact pieces of data that kind of led me into the study of speech stability because we just noticed visually, you know, wow, the one on the left has a lot more variation. It looks a lot fuzzier than the one on the right. 
Um, we quantify that variation in the case of ultrasound by looking at sort of the average difference um, between two curves if you try to connect them as directly as you can. Uh, you need a computer to do this because it involves doing a lot of computations. I have that graphed out for an experiment with about um, 45 participants uh, along the x-axis of this graph. Um, along the y-axis we have a similar measure which is how different are two curves um, from each other but in this case it was using that difference to look at coarticulation when things are in different vowel contexts how different do they look from one another um, but across the bottom we have speech stability in the open triangles we have uh, typically fluent adults that participated in this experiment and in the filled circles we have uh, young adults who stutter so a participant group that was basically the same as our adults um, but were people who were stutterers many of the stutterers look just like typical speakers but there are about seven over here that are much more variable than average um, this dashed line is two standard deviations from the mean in the typical participant population. Two standard deviations is supposed to cover about 95% of our data, which means in a sample of 20-ish speakers, we would expect one person to vary um, by more than two standard deviations from the mean on average. And in fact, we do have one of our typical speakers that wanders over that line. But in a sample the same size among stutterers, we have one who, you know, wanders barely over, a couple more a little farther, a couple more farther from that, and one that looks quite variable. Um, so one of the things we're currently doing uh, in uh, research on speech articulation by people who stutter is uh, to follow up this difference in speech stability that we've found in some speakers who stutter um, to see if that tells us anything meaningful about uh, the reason why they stutter or what we might be able to do therapeutically um, to help them get rid of their stuttering. All right, so to wrap things up, I want to bring things back to acoustics where we started, um, in part because acoustic measures of speech have been around for a lot longer than articulatory measures. So if I were to have given you a, a sort of full survey of applications of phonetics to communication disorders, there would be quite a bit more acoustics in what I talked about. But instead, I gave you kind of a sample of uh, a variety of different tools that are used. Um, in the current world with modern computers and the availability of Prot software, which is free to anyone who wants to download it, um, basically anybody can do an acoustic analysis of speech using the tools that are in Prot. You don't really need a laboratory. Um, all you need is a decent computer, a microphone to be able to record somebody. You know, a decent microphone helps. Uh, headphones to be able to listen to the speech. Again, decent headphones help you hear it a little bit better. Doesn't actually affect the analysis of the speech, however. Um, for about the last probably 50 years, we've known uh, which components of articulation uh, produce what sort of acoustic correlates in speech, or at least the, the most important ones or the most influential ones. Um, and so it's now practical for uh, speech therapists uh, with some knowledge of speech science to be able to record uh, their clients and take a look at aspects of their acoustics to see if they can detect something going on that they might not be able to hear with their ear. Uh, one of the best examples I know of this uh, is the concept of covert contrast. So when working with little kids that are having language acquisition problems, it may sound to a clinician like the kids can't make a distinction between two speech sounds, like the difference between a t or a k, the difference between a p or a b. Um, they may both sound like a p, for example, to a clinician. Um, but using acoustic analysis, people have found that it's often the case that the kids are making a difference. It's just not the right difference or a big enough difference for the clinician to hear it. Uh, and in fact, those kids generally do have resolvable communication disorders. Um, if kids uh, uh, sound like they're making 
uh, the same sound for two different phonemes, and when you measure them acoustically, they are in fact making acoustically similar uh, or identical things between those two speech sounds. Those are the really hard problems to fix because then there's no indication um, that there's any sort of awareness that there should be a speech sound difference there. Um, so it's that sort of thing that we can now uh, use in communication sciences and disorders really on a regular basis that you maybe wouldn't have been able to do say uh, 20 years ago in the field. Uh, all right, well, thanks very much for your attention during this uh, uh, recorded lecture. Uh, if you're interested in connecting with me, uh, despite that grumpy-looking picture I had on the first slide, uh, you're welcome to email me at AppState. I do have a YouTube channel that has a variety of recordings on it of uh, speech articulation, looked at with a few different tools, um, various other things I've collected up. Uh, over the years that I thought were interesting and also you know in this day and age um, quite a few uh, uh, online lectures for courses um, or topic lectures to help back up material that I have in courses. Uh, I also have a page on LinkedIn where I often uh, repost uh, say job ads for communication science and disorders students um, but uh, I also do uh, you know other interesting linguistic stuff. Uh, and I've got a Twitter account that I don't use a ton, but if I'm up to something interesting or new, or am someplace interesting or new, uh, like New Zealand for me anyway, uh, I may end up posting some pictures there. Um, so I hope uh, this was useful. If you have any questions, do feel free to uh, email me, and uh, thanks again.